me see here. Okay. Coming on a little bit late, but I'm here. Let's see here. Is anybody I know it's late? Coming on just a brief word tonight on the approval of the Father. Father's approval. Let me try to join me. I know I'm actually on here <clears throat> later than normal. But let's see. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I am so thankful that you could. Uh, as you begin to come in, please share this on your wall. I'm going to talk, amen, tonight on this topic concerning the approval of the Father, part two. And I'm going to go for like 30 minutes. That's the plan. But I want to thank you for joining me tonight. I know it's late. I usually come on around 930 or 945, but I had, to, I had some things come up. But I wanted to just come in and do a part two on this topic, the approval of the Father. I mean, it was rich, amen, on, amen, the other, <clears throat> on the other night. And so I know this is going to be even, come on, amen, better tonight. So I want to thank you for joining me. Just stay tuned as I get ready to jump into this topic and give people a chance to kind of pop on. And um, amen, I want to thank you for joining me. Okay. All right. I'll be right back. Just stay tuned. Amen.
right, welcome. Thanks for joining me again tonight. I'm so honored and blessed that you would join me. I want to go ahead and, and just start jumping right in because my time, come on, is coming. I came in very late tonight, but I'm here, amen, because I want to be a blessing to you in the Word. We're talking about approval of the Father, of the approval of the Father, part two, amen. I want to thank you, uh, Crystal, amen. Looks like Crystal was here first. She gets the gold. Crystal, welcome tonight. Thanks for joining me. Also, uh, Rayleigh, God bless you, Rayleigh. Thanks for joining me again tonight. Uh, Margie, come on in, Margie. My mom, how you doing, mother? Caldonia Lockhart is in the house. All right, all right. And then also, it looks like True, my sister, is here as well. Uh, I want to thank you guys again. I am so honored that you would join me this late this, this late at night. Amen. Um, but I believe you're going to get blessed. Amen. Matter of fact, what, what better thing? Come on, amen. What better thing? Come on, then, to, before you go to bed, to actually hear the word of God being preached and declared and to be able to have some good dreams and uh, have some some uh, uh, word to met, met, uh, meditate upon so that you can increase in your learning. You know, meditation in the word constantly. The Bible tells us in the book of Joshua, he gave him a commission. He said, meditate in the word day and night. Then you will make your way. Come on, amen. After you observe to do it, make your way successful. So he says, I want you to meditate. Joshua 1, amen, I believe it's verse 8. Meditate in the word day and night. Then you make your way prosperous uh, when you observe to do it, of course. But you got to keep it before you. In Proverbs 4, he tells us in verse 20, uh, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are life unto those who find them and health to all their flesh. So the word of God has promise of life in it. The word of God is the life of God. The, the, the Bible says the gospel is the is the power of God unto salvation. So the more I eat the word, the more I experience salvation. The word salvation in the Greek is the word, uh, one of the words that I like to use is sozo. Uh, um, <clears throat> I believe it's sozo. I'm, I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Sozo. Amen. Which means, come on, amen. Well, holiness, healing, health, all those things. You need God has provided that through Jesus. His actually name, his name actually means, come on, amen. His name actually means uh, savior, come on, salvation. He who he is salvation. Jesus is salvation, and so the Word is salvation. Come on, Amen. And He said, "If you want to know the Father, know Me. I am the salvation that you need." Now let's pray. I want us to go right into the Word, Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I do thank you again for truth, Lord, the liberating truth that you bless us to hear. I pray right now that you would give me articulation tonight as I talk about this topic, uh, part two. Lord God, on the approval of the Father, I pray that you would open my understanding up, open the understanding up of your people. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and encourage them right now. In the name of Jesus, encourage them. Lord, I pray that a new realm of light would begin to come in on the inside of them as they're hearing the word. Lord, you told us in all of our getting to get an understanding. So I pray for the spirit of understanding right now to begin to be released, uh, Lord God, through this broadcast. Lord, I can't bring understanding. Only you can bring understanding. I pray that you would grant me, Father God, the ability to articulate by the Holy Ghost that which will bring understanding to the listeners. And I thank you, Father, in the powerful, precious name of Jesus. Take me. I'm yours. Use me for your glory. And let your glory and your presence shine through me. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Okay, okay, okay. Hallelujah. Okay, let's do this. Okay, so um, a couple of things here. Um, I, did, I can talk about some Old Testament things, but I want to deal with, I want to deal with uh, uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament tonight, uh, and talk on some um, things that I believe will be uh, uh, eye openers. And so the Lord was giving me some things about deliverance, which I'm not going to get into right now tonight. But <clears throat> I feel like God wants to bring. Um, we need to be able to come to the Father. And Jesus has provided a way, or a way has been provided through Jesus to come to the Father. And when we look at the Word of God, when we look at the Word of God, it is very clear that Jesus is the way, the doorway to the Father. Now, he's the doorway. Now, if you look in John, the 10th chapter, Jesus testifies. Now, he even says this. Now, it's kind of striking that he would make this statement. But he says, um, he says that he was the door. Now, then he said later on in uh, John, uh, I mean, earlier, I should say, in John, was it John? Um, no, John 10. 
in John 10, he talks about, in John 4, he talks about being the door. In John 10, he, um, okay, I'm getting it mixed up. Sorry about that. I have a couple of things in my in my mind I'm thinking about, and uh, so I'm trying to uh, connect connect this. I'll just read it to you because that way it'll be, it'll be clear. Amen. Probably should be doing that in the first place. John 10 and verse uh, 1, he starts talking about, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entered not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So, but he that entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So he calls himself the door. God bless you, brother, brother Brian, man of God. Thanks for joining me tonight. So he says, this, he says that he's the door. And so he says, I'm the door to the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. So we know that Jesus is the door. He actually continues to talk about that. But in um uh in a, in a, in another chap another verse, I believe it's the I'm just gonna quote it because I, I'm having a hard time locating it right now in my mind. But it says that Jesus says, My I don't I don't preach my own doctrine. Jesus himself said, I don't preach my own doctrine. I don't preach something that's coming from my intellect, my ability, my own desires. I don't preach something that's coming from my own head. He says, the works that I do, I believe it's 519. I believe that's what it is. Let's look at that. I want to I wanna quote it right. Praise the Lord. Yeah. He says here, and then uh, there's another verse that says doctrine. But let's look at this one. It says, then the answer Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that son of man can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For the thing which soever he doeth, these, these also doeth the son likewise. So the son is doing uh, exactly what the father is doing. You understand this. The son is doing exactly what the father is doing. He references the father. So when he says, I am the door, he's not preaching his own doctrine. He's actually declaring what the father, come on, is revealing to him. And he says, my doctrine is not my own. So the testimony that Jesus was giving was not his own testimony. He was speaking by what you would call the spirit of revelation. And that means this, that Jesus didn't do anything except it was made known to him by the Father. He only spoke and did what the Father revealed him to him to do. Now, now let's finish reading this because I think this is really powerful in John 5 and verse 20. He says, For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that he doeth, himself doeth, and he will show him the greater works than these, that ye may marvel. As for as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. So he starts talking about how that the Father and him are so connected, and that he's only doing what he has been mandated to do by the Father, what has been revealed to him. So Jesus, come on, is it, it, and unequivocally, Quickly, the the Father. He is not. You cannot come on, Amen. You cannot separate Him and the Father. Matter of fact, we think about the Godhead uh, all together being one. Uh, there is a distinction because the Bible separates that in distinction in Scripture. But the way they function, the way they're unified, the way that you cannot bring division to them. Now, when we talk about this, I want you to catch this now that he is exemplifying and projecting the Father into the earth realm. In other words, he's revealing who the Father is by giving us a picture of the Father, the nature of the Father, who the Father is, so that we can actually know the Father. Now, I like this in John uh, 1, one of my favorite scriptures. I love to quote this scripture um, in John 1, uh, uh, St. John 1 and verse 18. Now, I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version because it just kind of like plays a little bit more on the words and it, and it brings out more detail. But it says, no man has seen, ever seen God. No man has ever seen God at any time. Now, this right here, uh, uh, think about this. You got to remember Moses uh, supposedly saw God. Uh, but here Jesus is actually uh, uh, giving you a real revelation that no man has actually seen God the way he's seen God and the way he reveals God. Now, the Bible says that Moses, he talked to God. God himself said, I talked to Moses face to face. Now, I believe that this was a, 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 a revelation that the Father had chose to reveal to him that was not like, come on, amen, that was not like Jesus revealing the Father. In other words, this is a deeper revelation of the Father. 
Moses was having what you would call, the Bible says the prophets of old would have visions. They would have similitudes and God would speak to them in dreams and things like this. But Moses was having a, what a manifested, I don't have time to go there and look at that, but in the, in the book of Exodus, the 33rd chapter, you can go back and look at it. He even requests that he may see God face to face. He says, God, I want to, I want to see your face. Show me your glory. I want to see all of you. I want to see the full expression of you. Now, I wanted you to catch this because the father is even, the father speaks to him and says, here's what the father says. He says, I cannot show you. He said, if, if any man looks on my face, he will die. So here Jesus is declaring right now, come on, amen, that this, he's, he is the full expression of the father. Watch this because it says John the Baptist, of course, or she's not John the Baptist, uh, John the Apostle is testifying of this revelation. He also testifies of it in 1 John Come on, amen, the first chapter, the same revelation. He says here, no man has seen God at any time. The only unique son or the only begotten God who is in the bosom, in the intimate presence of the Father. Ooh, glory to God. Jesus was in the very intimate presence of the Father. Come on, amen. And that's showing you the distinction between them. He was not just, he is God, but he was in the presence of God as God. They were all together as one because he says in the intimate presence of the father, he has declared him. He has declared him. So Jesus is the one that the father has chosen to declare him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He says he has revealed him and brought him out where he can be seen. He has interpreted him and has made him known. Proverbs 830 references. Now, I like this word interpreted him. God needed interpretation. There was a block between us and God because of our sin, because of our transgression and our disobedience toward the commands of God. Adam and Eve fell in the garden and God had to separate them from the garden. Now, this is interesting because God would come down in the garden personally and he would walk and talk and commune, come on with Adam and Eve. The scripture says in, uh, in uh, Genesis 3, it actually says, I believe around the eighth verse, that God came and the voice of the Lord was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The voice of God was walking in the garden. So this is an indication that God, come on, amen, probably more than likely, come on, amen, came uh, uh, and talked to Adam and Eve in the cool of the day at his regular time, appointed time. He came to talk to them and they were not in the right frame of mind and, and heart and condition to receive him. Amen. To receive him. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read uh, Proverbs 8, 13, because this is really good. And I'll go back to Genesis. It says, then I was, I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily in his delight, rejoicing always before him. See, so he's telling us, this is a revelation in the old Testament concerning the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is actually a, a prophetic confirmation of that. God was with God in the beginning. Come on, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Now, so we, when we think about God revealing himself and God needing to be interpreted, man had actually shut himself off from the Lord. In Genesis, the Bible says God had to put man out of the garden and he had put an angel with flaming sword of fire to keep the, them from entering back into the garden because he didn't want them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because that tree had a special, come on, a, an innate ability within it to come on, actually cause a person to live forever uh, and, and to be in a, sp in a certain state. Now they were already, now in what state they were in, they would remain there. That's what it had that ability. I don't know how, but God said it. That's how he said it. So I got to put them out of the garden. Why? Because I don't want them to eat of the tree and become eternally, come on, like this uh, uh, forever. I want to provide a way of redeeming them. I want to send my son, come on somebody, to, and, and I want to interpret myself to to them. How many know that when there, there's hostility between two, come on, nations, they send a man, a representative, an ambassador. They send somebody that can interpret, come on, amen, and communicate uh, uh, and help bring a, a, a relation and connection, amen, in the language, to speak, come on, the language, to relate. Jesus spoke the language by how he, by being a human. 
Jesus spoke the language by being a human. He he was in the father. He the father interpreted his communication, and there's an communication interpretation between uh, us and the father through Jesus. Jesus established, come on, and laid out in the, the the interpretation, come on, of the father, so we can understand the father. We can communicate, and we can be we can be restored in proper relationship. God had to bring peace. Now, do you know? Isn't it interesting that Jesus is the mediator? The Bible declares. Uh, in the book of um, um, let's see, the book of Colossians, I believe it is, uh, the mediator between God and man. Come on, Amen. The man, Christ Jesus, glory to God. He's become. He was the mediator. Come on, Amen. He mediated. In other words, he brought us together. Come on, Amen. With come on the Father. Let me just read it out of. Uh, um, there's a couple of different references here, uh, but he mediated uh, in in Ephesians. I'll read it in Ephesians. It says here that by um. Uh, having, um, t -t 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 let me see, in verse, um, verse uh, 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Come on, amen. And he came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. So Jesus came to unite us with the Father, and he did it with the by giving us something we could relate to, uh, being a friend to the point of being a savior, to the point of sacrificing his life so that he could bridge the gap between us and the Father. And he interpreted the Father's love because the Father's love had to be, uh, it had to be interpreted. It had to be uh, uh, revealed in a way. And how many know it, it can't even, even the death on the cross, that is a natural expression for us to see someone we're willing to give their life. The Bible said, "How no greater love than this than a man will lay down his life for a friend. But the Lord allowed, the Lord came and died on the cross so that he could uh, speak to us because he knew what speaks to mankind. And when they see someone who is completely innocent, take the brunt of, of the pain and the suffering and the death, come on, amen, of the, for the entire humanity, they will begin to understand or get a, a minute glimpse of the love of God for us. In other words, that he would sacrifice it all. Do you understand the love of God cannot even be fully come on grasp because God is love. That is God's nature. And it cannot even be fully grasped. Come on, amen, except we understand through someone giving their life on the cross. Now, isn't it interesting how much love suffered? When I think about the supernatural ability of love, that, that, that now when I use the word supernatural, I like to use the word preternatural because, you know, the world uses supernatural, but the word preternatural means beyond the natural. There was a strength that was beyond the natural for him to go to that cross. And I believe that it was by the Holy Spirit, come on, that Jesus, come on, amen, went to that cross and he laid down his life. And if you go through and look at what Jesus suffered, Come on at that cross. Matter of fact, his suffering began even in the garden of Gethsemane while he was in intercession in prayer. And he's, the scripture says he began to sweat like great drops of blood. It began to, his sweat was like drops of blood because of the intensity of our sin. And the, and the, the, the they said they, it's a medical ter, uh, terminology for that uh, when a person sweats blood that the, the capillaries in there, come on, in their skin and everything in their their blood, uh, blood vessels and everything, and in their skin, it all begins to come out and ooze out when they come under great duress or great stress. Jesus was taking the weight of the world. You're talking about the, the true revelation of having the weight of the world on your shoulder. He was taking the weight of the world and the pressures, come on, amen, of every single, come on, sin, every single person, come on, every, he took the brunt of sin itself upon him. Jesus took sin upon him so that he became sin who for us who knew no sin. You're talking about interpreting God's love. Jesus interprets the love of the Father that the Father would extend, come on somebody, amen, his own, come on, well-being in, 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 in his son, his own likeness in his son to, to be subjected to such intense suffering. Not only that, Jesus, come on, was spit on and they, they ripped off part of his beard. They, they hit him. Come on, amen. They, they, I mean, they did all types of, they called him names. They, they, they mocked him. They, they, they ridiculed him. Uh, 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 they, they, um, put a crown of thorns on his head. He was already bleeding. Come on, it's from suffering and such. They, 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 uh, uh, uh put a thorn of a corner, a, a, a crown of thorns on his head. And then, and then the scripture says they beat him. Come on with a cat and tail, which was like, a uh, 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 this, this thing that strapped with, come on, amen, with, uh, leather, leather, um, 
uh, uh, straps on it, leather pieces on it with, with bits of rock and sharp rocks and metal and all kind of stuff. And they whoop Jesus with this. Come on, amen, on his back. Come on, somebody, so that we could be. Now, you're talking about God interpreting his love to us. Y'all, I'm preaching good tonight. Y'all y'all need to give me some likes, come on, and some hearts. I'm preaching good tonight. Jesus took that on that to interpret the Father's love because the Father had to show us how much he loved us. Come on, amen. Now, somebody said, why would it take all of that? Why would it take all of that? Then the scripture says he was nailed. Come on, amen. He took nails. Come on, he took stripes on his back for our healing. Thank you, Annie Quiner. Praise God. Thanks for joining me. Uh, uh, he took he took stripes on his back for our healing. And then the scripture says they pierced him in the side. Come on, amen. They shoved a spear, come on, into his side, and out came blood and, and, and water. Come on, amen. They come on, amen. They um uh uh not only that, come on, they nailed him to a cross and the nails. Come on, amen. The nails in his hands, come on, and in his feet. Jesus suffered, and this was the Father's communication to mankind, saying. I love you. I love you beyond what you can even imagine. That's why it's so devastating. Because some people go, well, why would God let his son go through such torture if he really loved him? They, they don't even get it. That right there was the father. That's why that is why it's the proof that it is, it is that Jesus was God in the flesh. Come on, amen. This has nothing to do with just it being the son. It's a revelation of God himself coming in the flesh. Come on, amen, to mankind to interpret the Father's love to a rebellious, come on, and uh, rebellious uh, man, uh, humankind, rebellious uh, world. That And now the, the, the price has been paid. The, the provision of the blood is there, has been spilt, and is now prepared a way for all men to come to know Jesus Christ and to know the Father. See, and that's why you understand why it's so important to you or for you to receive Jesus. Because the approval of the Father is connected to receiving Jesus. You understand that the Father will not approve of someone who will look at the death of his son in a way and they disdain it and they look at it as, come on, amen, that was nothing. You know, that's like you seeing, you know, the most compassionate person in the world. If you saw a child, come on, humiliated and hurt and abused and even murdered and you saw it and you felt like nothing about it. You know, like, that ain't no big deal. Blah, blah, blah. And you know what? Men's hearts are getting more cold and more hardened. Come on. But God said that he would send his son. Are you listening to me? He, he said, he, I sent my prophets to them. This is in the scripture. He sent his prophets and, he, and they stoned his prophets. God would send truth and they stoned his prophets. He said, but now I'm going to send my son. Come on. Amen. And guess what they did? They murdered his son too. Come on. Amen. But this was not only his son. It was a revelation of God himself coming in the flesh interpreting the love of the Father to humanity. Woo, my God, what a good word tonight. Come on, somebody, amen. I hope you're getting this. That's why it's important for you to realize how great, how shall you escape, the Bible says, if you neglect so great a salvation. Understand there was a great price to pay that was paid for salvation itself. A great, come on, enormous price was paid for salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. If we are fearful of men more than we are, have a reverential fear of God, that God himself would give everything. The Bible said if he, free, if he gave his son, how much more will he freely give us all things? If he gave his son, do you understand that God wrapped everything up in the coming of his son? God concealed and God, come on, uh, could, uh, not only concealed, but compact, compacted, he um, packaged Every provision from heaven in his son, every provision in heaven, come on, is in the son of God. And when Jesus came and died, the father unpacked, come on, somebody, amen, everything in the revelation of his son. You're talking about interpreting the love of the father to a lost and rebellious humanity. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. And that's why it's important that we understand the value of it. Now, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament tabernacle had three different compartments to it. It had the outer court, it had the holy of holy, the holy place, I'm sorry, and then it had the holy of holies. So you've got, come on, some people have a different name, they might call it the outer court, the inner court, and then the holy, holy of holies. I'll say it that way. The outer court, the inner court, and then the Holy of Holies. And that was a place that was exclusively for a priest to go into once a year. One of the high priests 
uh, the high priest would go in once a year and he would go in there with the blood of a, of a lamb, a spotless lamb that had no blemish, which was a type and si- typology of Jesus Christ being that ultimate sacrifice. No longer would, do we need anybody to go in and offer any offerings on a, come on, on an altar anymore. Jesus became the ultimate offering. But here's what happened. That, that, that revelation is still here. That typology, the symbolism is still here. There was at the outer court, there was a, a place called the brazen altar. The brazen or bronze altar was a key element of the tabernacle in the wilderness and the place where the ancient Israelites sacrificed animals to atone for their sins. So there were many times, there were many other sacrifices. That one sacrifice once a year was for the whole camp of Israel. But there were other sacrifices that people would do if they committed certain sins during the, come on, during that year process. Come on, amen, certain sins, transgressions they would do. They would bring goats and bullocks and, come on, and different animals and oxen. And these, their people's sins would be atoned for. This was constantly going on. Do you know that we all must come to that place? It's called the place of repentance. Oh, come on, somebody. It's called the place of repentance. Do you know that repentance is a lost art? And one of the things that we've been talking about, we were talking about in our in our in our our leadership uh, gather uh, meeting that we had the other day, we were talking about the brazen altar came up. But we were talking about, and Brother Brian is on here. He can he can vouch for what I'm saying here. He was Brother God was giving Brother Brian some revelation on the altar, and I'm sure he'll talk more about that uh, in the future as God directs him. But there's uh, I heard a woman of God, Suzanne Hem Hen, uh, Benny Hen's wife. Benny Hen's wife was doing an interview. And she was sharing how that the, the, the minister was asking her a question. And he says, I know you've been in ministry. She had been in ministry for quite a few years and had been brought up in, in the Pentecostal and Pentecostal church, had been um, to, into the tutorage of, come on, her, her, her pastors, her, her, her dad. And her dad was, a, uh, I think she's like a third generation. They were like second or third generation pastors. Uh, and, and she was giving a testimony. God bless you, Tammy. Thanks for joining me. Daytona, come on in. Praise the Lord. And so she was giving her testimony, and she said she had actually uh, had uh, been under the tutorage. Tut- they had been under the tutorage of Derek Prince, who was another powerful theologian, uh, man of God, powerful man of God. But she was sharing uh, things just out of her experience, um, out of her experience. And and he was asking her. The man of God was this preacher was was interviewing her. He goes, he says, what do you see that the church is lacking today? that the church would need to be restored in order for us to experience the real revival that God wants to, that we believe God wants to bring. And, 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 and she began to say, the first thing she said, they have removed the altar from the church. They have removed the altar from the church. She said, it used to be where we could go to the altar and we could kneel down before the Lord, but the altars have been removed. Now, now in some churches they still got the altar, but most churches don't have the altar anymore. And so I begin to think about this. This is so true because I remember as a young man in church, because I got born again when I was very young, that I would go to church and whenever we would go uh, and, and we would go to repent or get right with God uh, about something, we would go to the altar. We would kneel down. Uh, I remember a young uh, a friend of mine, uh, we both went to the altar together and I was on the altar crying out before the Lord. He was at the altar crying out before the Lord. And I finally got up from the altar after spending some time there crying out to the Lord. Uh, and and uh, it, the altar is like a bench, you know, with a with a rail, and you 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 kneel over it and put your arms on it. Come on, Amen. Uh, anyway, um, anyway, he was on this altar, and I got up from the altar because I was done praying, and and he went. Uh, he 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 stayed there. He stayed there, and I was like, wow, he's really he's really you know there for a long time. Something's going on here, you know. And then finally he got done, and and he came back and told me. What, he, what had happened? And I said, what happened to you, man? He said, I just had a vision of hell. I just saw hell. He says, all of a sudden, I, I closed my eyes to cry out to the Lord or to talk to God. And he says, that the, 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 it turned complete darkness. And it was like something opened up. And I began to see, come on, amen, into a dark pit. Come on, amen, with the fire and with the, um, I began to see like a dark pit and the fire. And I began to hear the groans and the screams of people coming up. Come on, amen, from this coming from this abyss. And he said, that's why I couldn't get up. He says, and he was broken. He was so broken. God gave him a glimpse into hell. Now, this is so important here in in regards to that the altar is the place that can save you from a burning hell. 
a lake of fire, the altar, repentance. And so the brazen altar was used for repentance, repentant, having a repentant mind, a repentant heart. It changed. Why? Because the blood that was sacrificed causes you to see the cost of your sin. It causes you to see, the Bible said the life is in the blood. So when the blood is shed, it causes you to see, come on, amen. It causes you to see, come on, amen, the value uh, of life and the sin, come on, amen, the, the penalty of your sin and the price of your sin. All right? Now, God is calling us to a place to come into real repentance. And in the day we're living in, there's a lot of false repentance. And I'm not going to be before you much longer, but I wanted to, to deal with this. Uh, this, fear, this false repentance or self-motivated repentance that is not motivated by God's goodness and God's grace and God's ability. In 2 Corinthians 7, 10, I'm going to read this in the Amplified or the New Living Translation. Uh, it says, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience. Now, there's different sorrows you can get. You can get a sorrow, come on, that is not coming from God, not a godly sorrow. Maybe a sorrow that you got caught or a sorrow or grief that, you know, uh, you know, the consequences that you have to experience. But there's a godly sorrow that comes from the Lord. And, and here's what he says, for this kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin. So, so the kind of sorrow that God gives us leads us away from sin. It doesn't just go, man, I wish I had never got caught. You know, if I had never got caught, I could have got away with that. No, no, no. This actually, this godly sorrow leads you away from sin. That You don't want to live that way anymore. And, see, and the result of it is, it says, salvation. This is the uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10. It says, there's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But here's another sorrow. A worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So in other words, I just, you know, I'm just sorry that I got caught, you know, or I'm sorry for the consequence I got to go through. You know, I, I, as soon as I get out of here, I, as soon as I get out of this dog, out of this dog cage or whatever, as soon as I get out of this, come on, amen, as soon as I get out of prison, as soon as I get out of this, come on, amen, this penalty, I'm going to go right back to doing what I was doing. No, there is a preternatural godly sorrow and ability that God brings you to your knees. Did you begin to reverence and fear God? You begin to recognize his goodness. You begin to recognize how he is because it says that this godly sorrow leads us to repentance. In other words, it's a, a goodness. Now, the Bible also talks about this, his kindness that leads us to repentance. There's a kindness that leads us to change. God doesn't just beat us over the head with the word to get us to change. God knows how to love you in. Now, there are God will bring correction. God will speak truth to you. Yes, he will. But the goodness of God is revealed many times in the revelation of giving you the truth, that you would be, you would be privy to truth where other people cannot hear it, that God would give you an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to change. Not everybody has that ability. And God gave you the grace to come. He, he gave it to you because you looked at him. You know, I, I always believe this. When, 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 uh, when Moses looked at the burning bush, the Bible says when God saw that he looked, you see that? Then God spoke from that bush and begin to call him. God is trying to see if you're looking toward him. Come on, amen. That's right. Remove the pride, accept the Lord. That's right. Praise God. So we got to look toward the Lord. So the fear of man and, and the fear of uh, the fear of man is a, is a, is a thing that causes a, a, a phony sorrow. It, it doesn't, you're, you're, you're not, you don't understand. The Bible says you're supposed to be fearing God who can put both your, your, but they can destroy both your soul and your body and cast them into the lake of fire. That's the fear of God. Come on, amen. That's the godly fear. Now, the fear of the Lord, come on, amen. And there is a terror of the Lord. And this terror of the Lord or the fear of the Lord, come on, is to recognize that God is. Now, we have a natural honor for our earthly fathers. Um, you know, my dad was pretty strict on us. And so he, he put the fear in us. We, 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 man, I had people in my neighborhood scared of my dad. <laughs> we'd be walking down the street and we'd be, and they go, man, your dad, we all jump in the bushes. My dad had us. Yeah. Cause we were up to stuff too. So yeah, we were just all over the place. Amen. I was pretty young. I was probably 11, 10, 11 years old. I was, I was, I was 10, 11, 12 years old, acting up, cutting up. Come on. Amen. Uh, how many thank God for salvation? <laughs> Come on. Amen. Salvation. I got born again when I was 13, almost 14 years old. So God got a hold of me at a, at a young age. 
Come on, amen. Hallelujah. I was just telling somebody about that today, man. My dad told us to go out. He would have us go out and pick our own switch. He said, you go out and get, the, get me a limb. He, and you better not bring back no little twig. <laughs> amen. Go get me a branch. Go get me a branch. Anyway, anyway we, were, we were disciplined. I'll just say it that way. And, and, and he put fear in us to, about doing evil, about doing wrong. And listen, somebody said, well, that was abuse. Well, you know what? I'm still alive. I made it through. Uh, and, and God is teaching me things here. I, I, and I don't, of course, I don't beat my children like that. Never have. Come on. Amen. But as you grow, you learn how to do it the right way. Amen. And so I give grace to, and, and understanding toward him and toward that generation because they went through stuff in their generation and the generation before that. Oh, there's, that's a long story. I ain't got time to get into that. But uh, we need to understand that the devil operates with the fear of man. He wants you to think about your physical life. He wants you to think about all the things that have to do with the natural. But he don't want you to think about the spiritual eternal. That's why he blinds people to the reality of the eternal. He wants them to think everything is temporal. Everything is about satisfaction now, what I can get now. And so the fear of man makes you focused on temporal Come on, satisfaction. Come on, and what can be taken from you and if people laugh at you and if they mock you or, or whatever. And you know what? That right there is not worth your eternal soul. That is not worth your eternity. Come on, amen. The Bible said, what is it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What, what, if you, what if you lose some friends? It don't matter. The fear of the Lord, come on, is more powerful and more important, come on, than the fear of man. And so we got to remember that Jesus himself uh, delighted in the fear of the Lord. He received, he responded and, and, and respected the Lord, the, the Father God. He respected him. Come on, even as God in the flesh, he respected and had the fear of the Lord. It actually says that in scripture. So whenever you're afraid, for example, if I'm just afraid of hell, and if I'm just afraid of, come on, amen, of being put in hell or being destroyed or dying or whatever, I really don't understand the greatness of God. God has the power to put you there. I should have more reverential fear of God than I do hell. You know, I got born again. I'm going to tell you the straight up truth. I got born again out of fear. When that preacher counted, I'll never forget it. He said, I'm going to count to three. And if you don't get up here, you're going to hell. And he said, one. I was like, okay. Man, I was shaking. I said, two. I was like, oh, God. He said, three, man, you should have seen me running. I ran up there. I was in complete terror. Come on, amen, of hell. And I got up there to the altar. I laid down before the Lord. I was probably like, what, 13 years old or so. Come on, amen, when I got saved. And God still used it. God said, I will let Calvin come in on fear, but after I'm going to reveal him how much I love him. I'm going to show him the revelation of my love. Glory to God. God let me come in on fear. Come on, amen, and then he got a hold to me. I believe the fear of the Lord mixed in that. Come on, amen. The fear of the Lord mixed in there and God used it to bring me out. Sometimes God will just scare you a little bit and then get you to the point that you will see how much he really loves you. Come on, amen. Now the fear, come on, I'd rather have God scare me a little bit than let me go to an eternal hell. Come on, amen, and be destroyed and have to dispose of me. Amen. So we need to get to the point that we fear the Lord himself more than we fear, come on, amen, any other, come on, amen, any other, uh, any other thing. So the approval of the father, the approval of the father, Edebo Sataya, is a very, very important. Without the father's approval, you have no access to heaven. You have no access to the heavenly community without the father's approval. Now understand the father's approval is easily come by. It's called turn to Jesus, accept him as your Lord and Savior. And if you have it, now understand this is very important here because it's really, really important for us to catch this. Every believer is constantly receiving Jesus. Don't just think you're receiving him one time and that's it. You're constantly receiving Jesus. Now, I can let me just show that before I close this out, because that way people won't think I'm just making this up. Amen. In John, in, in, in St. John, the first chapter, let's go to the word because you can't listen. You can't argue with the word. Amen. It's so easy for people to fall into the trap of the fear of man. The devil is. That's right. That's right. Chris and Sue Munson. God bless you. Thanks for joining me. All right. All right. All right. Now watch this. Now <clears throat> he says here in uh, St. John verse uh, chapter one, verse 12, but as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 
Now, this this uh, 12th verse, but as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority. The word receive here, and I actually learned this from an actual Greek uh, Greek um, scholar, Roy Hicks. You can look it up. <clears throat> the play on this word, received, means continuously. It means to continually receive the Lord. So that's why when we take the Lord's Supper, what we're doing is we're acknowledging him. We do this in remembrance of him. When I feed on the word, I'm constantly eating of Jesus. Repentance is constantly taking, partaking of Jesus. Repentance is constantly, come on, amen, denying ourselves and renewing our minds to the way he wants to be, wants us to live. Repentance is, the word repentance actually means to think differently afterwards. It is to change the way, come on, you live. It is to think differently. Amen. That's why it's extremely important, extremely important that you don't look at the word repentance as a one-time deal and think, what do I need to repent for now? No, no, no. Repentance means to think differently afterwards. Repentance is a continuous action. It's renewing the mind. The fruit of, renew of a renewed mind is repentance. Come on, somebody. Amen. The, the, the fruit of a re renewed mind is repentance. Amen. So get in that word and repent. Get in that word and repent. Change your lifestyle. I got some kind of little thing flying around here. That's why y'all keep me, see me doing this little thing flying around. Listen, I want to thank you for joining me. I'm so honored that you would join me. Remember, paypal.me slash open heaven, cash app, dollar sign, apostle Calvin, P.O. Box 490416, Blaine, Minnesota, 55449. If you want to sow into the ministry. Don't forget, amen, that I've written a book called Utterances. Amen. This is a very powerful book, Discerning the Origin and Nature and Identity of Voices. Um, a little bit off the back of the book here. You want to get a hold of this? You can send a pay, uh, send something on PayPal, a donation. The book uh, retails at sixteen ninety five. The book Divine Sealbreakers I have it retails at uh, fifteen ninety five. It's another good book. The Divine Sealbreakers, the Authority of Apostles and Prophets. Amen. Um, and I want to encourage you if you want to sow into the ministry of any gift you want to give, we'll send those books to you. Amen. Be a blessing uh, to us. Amen. To help us continue to do this. I'm actually writing two other books right now. And uh, but these books are available now. I'm actually writing two other books. The Holy Spirit has put these things in my heart. Very good book. This book on utterance. Let me read a little bit off the back here. It means this is what it says. This book will broaden your understanding regarding utterances. We will explore, watch this, the power of utterance, how to distinguish the influence behind them. How God gave us the ability to rule in our world under his dominion. Oh, my goodness. With our words. Why there is a fight between light and darkness for your words or utterances. And how God, how God ultimately wins. But who wins in your life is determined by your own utterance and much more. Come on, somebody. Amen. Really good word. And this book on divine seal breaking. Another good book. Amen. Divine Seal Breaker. This one here, I've been, this has been several years that uh, this revelation uh, has been marinating in my spirit for many years and uh, almost 25 years. And uh, I've been waiting for a time to share it and I was able to share it in this book. But the Divine Seal Breaker, amen. That's right. God ultimately wins in the end, but who wins in your life? Come on, amen. It's determined by your words. That's why the Bible said that the life and the power of your tongue. And it also says, come on, amen, that you eat the fruit of your words. Divine Seal Breakers is about the role and function of specific individuals set by God, given by Jesus. Amen. Let me just uh, pop up this little, um, see if I can pull it up here. I think this is it right here. Yeah, there it is. Uh, it, on the, it, this is what it says in the back of the book. It says, uh, individuals set by God, given by Jesus, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is about the authority to unveil something hidden in Scripture to the church. It is recognizing and receiving from them and their extreme importance in the unveiling process. It is not adding or subtracting from Scripture, or should I say writing new revelation. The writing of Scripture has already been completed. It is bringing illumination of these specific truths by the Holy Spirit with power to and through the church. So, and I mean, but there's so much. I share testimonies in here, uh, uh, all kinds of things that God has uh, shown me over the years, visions I've had, dreams, revelation, so that you could get blessed Amen by that. 
But I am so honored again for you joining me. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, of course, like I said, if you if you want to, uh, uh, you can send a man your email address, not email address, I'm sorry, your mailing address to, I'm going to put this in here right now. I, I meant to do this earlier. I should do it, but I forget because I, I'm, I kind of just pop on. Amen at Gmail. Okay, so I'm going to put this in there now. So it'll be available for those who want to send their address. HarvestPraiseII at gmail.com. I put that in there. So if you want to send your address, we'll send these books to you. But you need to sow, amen, some type of seed or donation, amen, in order for me to get those to you. I actually have uh, Brittany. Will probably, Brittany will be getting that to you. She's working in that department, and she'll get that information to you, that those books to you. Amen. Those two books. And you don't want, listen, they're going to be a blessing to you. Come on, amen. I mean, no, you can't tell everything at one time, but when you put it in book form, people can go back and look at it and read it and 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 get a lot of good things from it. All right. Well, listen, I better get going here. I'm so honored that you would join me again. Thank you so much. Pray that you have a beautiful night. Uh, I didn't mean to be on here this long, but it was a good word. Y'all got to acknowledge it was a good word. Amen. But I want you to have a great night. I'm looking forward to talking to you. I'll probably come on on, on Saturday night. Amen. And uh, we'll share another word. Be a blessing to you. All right. Have a good night. Be blessed.